Uh, so Steve is going to be talking to us about Apache Stream, simplifying real-time data integration. And anyone hear me through the mic? It's on. How about now? Okay. If Hello? Okay. If for some reason you can't hear, please let me know. So thank you for coming. Uh, Apache Streams is an incubator project, um, and I'm going to tell you about uh, kind of the reason that it exists and some of the things that it does today, some of the things that uh, we hope it will do in the future. Um, there's going to be some, part of what I'm going to be talking about is kind of the state of social data, and a lot of that is, you know, opinion. You don't attribute it to anyone other than me. It's just my observations from being in the industry for the last couple of years. So, Apache Streams uh, tr is trying to look at the problem of how do you write code for processing, managing, and analyzing uh, the real-time web. Uh, so that means social data, it means web crawl data, it means just any types of feeds that you may want to get an assessment of um, as events transpire and uh, build, build models of the world based on uh, what you can observe from what's going on around the, the web and in social channels. So Apache Streams contains um, specifications of document types. Um, so uh, what that kind of means is uh, if you go hit the Twitter API, you usually get back something that looks the same um, almost all the time, but not every time. Interfaces are always kind of leaky. Apache Streams uh, start, is looking at how can we really put and bake straight into the processing engine schemas for the types of objects that we're processing so that we can validate them at every step and check that uh, we have what we expect to have. Um, and this is really important, so support for multiple runtimes. So I want to be able to write my code once and run it in my local dev environment, run it in Storm, and run it in Hadoop when I need to go uh, make a change and, and then backfill uh, the entire data set that I have. Um, and it's a collection of loosely coupled um, activity integrations. So there we're talking about like upstream data providers that uh, you might hit on a polling basis or that you might uh, get stream, streaming data from. Um, processors, so transforming the data, uh, manipulating it, um, annotating it based on your algorithm's opinion or some other web service's opinion of that information, and then storing it out so that uh, you can go hit different APIs to, to do analytics on that information. And the idea here is that streams can be a collection of, of small self-contained pieces that when woven together can give you a, a, a very powerful end-to-end um, -end data pipeline. So the, it's, the project is very early. We're in 01 snapshot. Uh, we have support in there for a couple of streaming data providers, Twitter and DataSift, um, four polling data providers, um, then uh, a, a larger collection of schemas. So we've worked with a lot of these different um, data providers that we'll talk about and built uh, XML and JSON schemas that reside in the project. So you can go use that to write JVM code that touches that data um, with some compile and, and uh, build time assurance that you know what you're going to get um, when you connect up to those endpoints. And then persistence libraries. And we'll, we'll, we'll walk through a, a lot of this stuff. My, I hope to be done talking in about 15 minutes and then to walk you guys through some of the more interesting parts of the code and then through some interesting examples and then have plenty of time for Q&A. So in social data today, there's a multiple different you know, providers. You can get social data directly from the, the owner network. That would be like Twitter or Facebook. You can buy it wholesale in a lot of cases. So via GNIP or... Uh, data sift, you can basically sample the fire hose at a more uh, entry level price point. Or then there's also what I call retail level data providers, which is you have some web service and they've provided an API so you can bring, put data in and take data out, but that's, they're really just about using their application. They give you an API um, to address concerns with lock in and data ownership. Um, so there's a lot of data providers out there, um, and they have, in my, they have overt competition based on which channels they have access to, um, the degree of coverage they have over those channels. Um, your experience pulling Facebook data from GNIP and DataSift will vary um, with the same, with, you'll think you're asking the same questions, but you'll get different results. So they have competition based on how good they are at giving you the data you're looking for. Um, price, of course, and then 
these, these networks are you know, differentiating based on the sorts of uh, the niceties of using that platform, either from the developer's perspective or the ops perspective or the um, analyst perspective. So what features are there in the API? Um, how, how quickly can you turn around new data? Um, having, having created a data stream, how much can you learn about it without having to spin up your own analytics? Uh, that's kind of where the state of the competition in this industry is right now. Um, so this is kind of just a simple catalog of the issues that you have working with social data in real time. There's basically no standardization of data schemas. Um, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and GNIP and Datasift all have completely different APIs. Um, you're lucky if you can get a schema that describes what you would find at any of those endpoints. More often than not, you just get some documentation that may or may not be fully up to date. Um, the, the validation that's happening upstream, um, you can't always rely on it. You really need to be validating the data at each step in your own pipeline in order to make sure that uh, you're, you're getting what you expect to get um, to um, prevent downstream side effects of not getting what you expected to get. Uh, when it comes to you know, measurement of how many uh, items you're processing and at what rate and uh, at, what, at which of your, the nodes in your storm topology uh, the, uh, the, the data vendors are not really providing you all that much to deal with that problem. Uh, you're pretty much dealing with that yourself through your, through your runtime engine and, your, and whatever type of logging that you put into your cluster, which you're then um, figuring out how to make sense of that on your own. You know, with the proliferation of libraries, so if you look at all the different providers, they often will have like a Python SDK and a Java SDK, which are basically um, kind of nice, sometimes, wrappers around their REST APIs, um, but they don't always have all of the features in the individual SDKs. Uh, and then you have to figure out which Maven repo they sit in. You have to go pull them down. You've got to figure out how they work in order to actually get the data flowing. Um, and we think this could be a lot easier uh, than it is today. And then it can be tough to clearly identify um, ownership or rights. The APIs typically don't have much to say about that. It's kind of on you to have the right contracts with all of the counterparties in ecosystem and make sure that you don't um, get out of hand or end up getting yourself in trouble. So as a summary, it's kind of a mess for developers, for operations, for finance, and for legal um, at an agency like ours. And I suspect there's a lot of other firms who are working in this area, and we're basically all solving these exact same problems on our own in silos. Um, so part of the reason that we started Streams is to bring collaboration um, into, into the open and help uh, help us work on this stuff together. Question? You mentioned ownership and rights on the previous page. Are you talking about authentication and authorization? Um, I'm really more talking about what do you have the right to do with that, with that piece of data that you paid for. You probably have a limited, oh, a limited license to it. Ownership of the data itself. Right. And what you're contractually uh, allowed to do. Um, that stuff is not generally handled at the platform level, either by the provider right. or by any technology that's in wide use today. Um, so here are some of the project goals, to basically reduce the complexity of data integration projects with a special focus on real-time data. Um, allow, allow us to connect both to web endpoints and to enterprise software endpoints. These uh, ecosystems have basically been mostly separate uh, but there's no reason that that needs to be the case forever. Um, to promote common data schemas and API patterns. So Activity Streams is one of the, the inspirations behind the project. Activity Streams tries to define a generic, extensible um, data shape for representing actions that happen in digital channels. Um, and so we're trying to foster adoption of Activity Streams by making it really easy to get started and to build activity stream pipelines and connect those pipelines to counterparties within your organization or elsewhere on the internet. Um, to decouple business logic from runtime framework. So this comes back to, I want to write my, uh, my geotagger once and I want to be able to run that in Storm and in Hadoop and in my local test environment without having to bind to all of those interfaces and then maintain three separate modules to do that. Um, then we want to supply an open, uh, simple, scalable reference implementation for activity streams processing and data processing in general. So these are somewhat lofty goals. So let me talk about what activity streams um, does uh, pretty much right now. So it can hide the data provider, processor, and persister API complexity 
um, and basically wrap it so that when you're talking to HDFS or Elasticsearch or Cassandra or to Twitter or to GNIP or to Datasift, you, the objects that you interact with to establish those connections and to make calls through the API to pull back what you're looking for can look, this, can look more or less the same. There's always some subtleties, but the goal is to hide that complexity of each of those different groups of APIs so that they can all look more or less the same from the perspective of the uh, individual or group building and maintaining the data pipeline. Um, it uses pretty simple interfaces um, and supports multiple runtimes. So I can write my processor and I can run it in uh, local mode and I can run it in Hadoop um, on the documents. Um, the stream definitions aiming towards composable. So the idea being that you're putting together a collection of steps um, into a directed acyclic graph. Um, and right now we do that with Java code, but we hope someday to be able to bootstrap it off of a dot file or off of some um, model that basically matches the conceptually that flow of data. Um, generates classes that match each of the uh, data objects that you expect to get from these, each of these data providers off of XML and JSON schemas, giving you Java objects that are serializable through Jackson. And uh, if you wanna get started working with data from those systems, then you basically have a lot of help there to get started working with that, with that data set. Um, to focus on flexibility and portability, and then try to introduce some de facto standard usage practices of, of activity streams. Um, activity streams uh, does uh, provide and supply like a specific set of about 20 verb types and we'll take a look at some of this stuff in a minute. Um, however, in what cases you would actually use those verbs um, if you're trying to normalize data from four or five different sources and how you would take advantage of the different um, fields that are on the activity streams object. Uh, it doesn't have much to say about what's required and not required in different situations. It's more or less up to the implementation. Um, so the hope is that by having a, an open source project where there's you know, basically run off the shelf connections to a variety of different sources and a variety of different databases, um, some standard usage practices can emerge that, uh, that, the community, that can then help uh, the community interchange uh, data in real time uh, more effectively with less pain. Um, so if you guys are interested in following along on your laptops, I shortened uh, the link to the, to the Git repo and you can pull it up. Otherwise, I'm going to just, I'm gonna put it on the screen and kind of talk about some of the different core pieces of streams. Before I do that, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Yeah, some of them are, there's a lot underneath, so we'll pull those up and take a look at what's in there. So I'm gonna start with, um, with core, which is a simply, which is the collection of interfaces that are runtime agnostic. Uh, and they cover, they cover things like, how do you describe a provider? How do you describe a processor? How do you describe a persistence object? Um, I expect these to, to evolve to have additional flexibility. Um, but for now, they're basically the, the minimum that we, that we needed to address the use cases that we're tackling. Okay, so the atomic unit of, da of data is essentially an, a streams datum, which is a very lightweight wrapper around object. Hopefully this will pull up. So with, very, with uh, some kind of generic metadata like the identifier of the document, um, the timestamp of processing in order to facilitate uh, batching um, and so on. But yes, uh, it's, not, it's not tuples, it's just objects. So we have streams where we use objects that uh, are generally generated off of schema documents. We'll look at a, a few of those. But streams doesn't restrict you to using activity streams and it doesn't restrict you to using only objects that fit some um, arbitrary interface or abstract class. 
Um, there's, uh, there's some mechanisms in here for counting the volume of information that goes through the streams. So there's an interface for um, uh, data status countable, so you can increment just like, a, like you might do in, in Hadoop or in Cassandra. Um, there's a notion of like what is the state of the stream. Um, there's a notion of uh, uh, basically the, a persist reader. So this is pulling out of a, of a database for the most part writing to a database, um, performing a process, processing. So a processor basically gets a list of datums, or sorry, it gets one datum and then it's able to provide an empty list or a list with however many um, items it wants to discern. And that may just be a copy and append or it may be come up with an entirely different activity because you're inferring some activity out of a more kind of a compound activity. Oops. A provider has methods for um, start stream, read current, read new, read range over a time range. Um, this extends operation, which I'll pull up really quickly, which um, so the setup is, can differ in its implementation in different runtimes, but the, the concept is still the same for each. There's a prepare and a cleanup. Um, we borrowed kind of liberally from how, from how Storm addresses these problems, but wanted to make sure that, uh, we can, that we can basically do the same thing in a local mode or in some other um, runtime. So process and cleanup, the configuration is based on type safe. Um, so essentially the idea is that you can supply one or more config files. Um, the config can come from environment variables, it can come from command line parameters. TypeSafe takes care of merging all of that together into one master configuration object, which your main, uh, which your main stream class gets access to and then is able to break down um, into individual configuration um, modules that can go to each of the steps you're gonna start. But by default, every step will see the entire configuration of the pipeline and can kind of pick and choose out the parts that it wants to use to configure itself. Okay, I'm gonna jump to Streams Pojo. So Streams Pojo, we basically took the JSON schemas for Activity Streams version 1.0, dropped them into the project with very, very minor changes. And did I just jump into the wrong one? Apologies. Here's what I want. And then the yeah, the, the Palm basically uses JSON schema to Pojo to generate out classes that cover all of the different possible um, items that you can find in an activity. In each of the different providers that are in here, they, they do basically the equivalent for whatever is the native data type that you get from their API. So if you open up data sift, you'll see it's a data sift interaction and then all of the sub objects that you might find there. Um, for tweets, you'll see the tweet object, the retweet object, the delete object, um, and same for, for most of the providers. So the JSON schemas here are basically just, there's a object which is the top, or activity is the top level object. There's a couple of kind of wrapper items. There's a handful of, these are the verbs that, the, that version 1.0 defined. I know version two adds, a, adds some additional verbs and I think there's some extensions that do as well. Um, and also has kind of an extensibility model where you can describe um, verbs that are outside of the core spec in version two. Um, and then these are the, the core object types that activity stream spec defines. Um, there's you know, ideas of the notion of audio, video, files, folders, comments, shares, likes, um, products, reviews. So all of this stuff generates a big object that you can that you're encouraged basically to use as the object that you pass through your stream and ultimately persist and analyze. Um, and it's pretty flexible. It can cover pretty much any use case that you might have. Um, again, we're, we're chasing the idea of interoperability between systems with minimum friction of data mapping and data integration. There's a long way to go, but the standard does have some traction in industry. So um, GNIP relies on it for, uh, or offers it as an access mode. I, I think Facebook does as well. Um, Bottlenose does. So there is some movement towards 
Um, activity streams is a common mechanism of interchange for social data, um, but it's not universal, and we hope to make it, to give people reasons to, to adopt it. Um, Okay, so this is the runtimes folder. So we have a pretty mature um, local runtime. So the way this one works is your main class creates the, the flow that you want. It runs start. Um, basically goes and forks off a bunch of threads that use um, that use queues, whichever type of queue you want to use to move data from one step to the next. Um, if you want to do branching, there's an implementation in, in local that will handle branching. So you could, the same item can go to three different places. Um, even, uh, even if, you know, so you don't need to worry about one consuming. It's kind of a, it, it does support a pub sub model. Um, um, there's a runtime for, for pig. So these are basically lightweight pig wrappers around the processors that you write. So you can then go read out of HDFS um, and use pig to perform the same processing steps that you ran on your real time flow uh, in case you need to go make a change and reload everything, which we find very useful. Um, there's a runtime for Storm that's still work in progress. It was working uh, at one point, but then we've uh, made some, some refactorings and we're actively trying to get the, the Storm runtime back online with adequate test coverage to ensure that uh, we can rely on it and roll it to production. Um, and then there's been some work as well around using Tomcat as a container and using Camel for routing. So this uh, is not all of the, the items that you're going to look at in the contrib folder are not supported in this runtime yet, but it's something that that the group is working on. Okay, so I'm gonna so I'll jump to the contrib folder and give you a sense of uh, what's currently in there and what it's able to do. So we have persistence modules for Cassandra for writing to console, which is equivalent to writing to file. Um, Elasticsearch, HBase, HDFS, uh, Kafka, and MongoDB. Um, we have processing engines that include uh, kind of the type of URL work that you have to do in applications like this. So it's unwinding URLs, um, resolving them, figuring out what their atomic or you know domain is, uh, domain tokenization, that kind of thing. Uh, we have uh, a wrapper around uh, Tika, which we use the boiler pipes specifically. Although there's a lot more features in Tika um, for looking at binary files like PDF files and Word files and extracting out. Um, the content in the metadata. Um, so we use this for looking at articles on the web and finding out who's the author and what was the published date and so on. So there's uh, a bunch of stuff in here for finding metadata like uh, Dublin Core, Open Graph, um, scanning through it and figuring out uh, what metadata we want to associate to the document that we actually found a link to through Twitter or wherever. Um, then when this uh, the Lucene module is for basically performing Lucene tagging on data in flight so that you can come up with a, an array of tags that you might use for analysis or for routing or for notification. Um, as far as data providers, um, we have uh, support for data sift in there, although it's not um, completely um, tested at this point. Um, we have uh, Facebook that is basically in there to have a Facebook schema, although we don't have a, a a pipeline connector to Facebook yet, although uh, we will. Um, GNIP, um, Google. So we have a provider that can go basically pull down your Gmail archive and give it to you as activities or as raw Gmail objects um, and uh, for Google Plus as well. We have um, Moreover, which is a wholesale data supplier of uh, news and blogs and uh, broadcast media from around the world. Um, uh, an RSS polar, so you can basically give it a list of RSS feeds and it'll go check them every X seconds. And whenever new stuff shows up, it'll pass those through your queue. Um, Sysmos, which is a company that belongs to Market Wired, but we've used them as a data source on some projects. Um, and then um, Twitter, of course, we do a lot of work with Twitter. And um, when we jump to the examples, you'll, we'll see a lot of Twitter examples because they're pretty simple and everyone here understands um, Twitter and it's pretty easy to walk through walk through that stuff. Um, so right now, all of these different contributed modules are just sitting in the project. I think it's possible at some point we'll move to a model more like Storm has, where these will be sub-modules that individual um, groups who may not be committers on this project may want to basically say, 
hey, we, we are the, the Kafka team. We'd like to maintain the Kafka module for, for streams. And then we can just link them up via submodules um, at some point. Any questions so far about any of this? So there is, there's a Kafka reader also. So you can, whatever objects you're putting into Kafka, you can basically pull out as strings and then create activities off of them. Um, but with, I think when we're talking about enterprise, we're looking at things like, like Yammer or the kind of the, the new generation of social, like SharePoint, like kind of exchange, the kind of things that you would typically find that may have APIs but don't, are not really, I guess, all that sexy for people to work on. Um, but yet there's rich streams of activity about your enterprise that are happening in those channels. Um, so the theory being that by having a system like this, you can merge the activity streams off of your owned enterprise um, software applications and the activity that your employees are conducting on public channels like, like Twitter. Um, and then be able to look at those activities side by side and get a, a more holistic picture about what's going on. Absolutely. Like I'm advising a startup and they want a BoxNet integration, so I'm gonna help them build a BoxNet integration so they can see a stream of like what are the, the files that are going into into the box as they happen. Yes? So is that to say that there's nothing stopping you from writing a, an adapter for an ERP system that's some kind of long running query, you know, like an ongoing query? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and we'd in, we would encourage you know, contributions of that back, but there's no reason that you need to, right? So you can, you can write that and you can run that in streams uh, by simply writing classes that extend the streams interfaces. Um, and we'll look really soon at some examples of what that looks like in code and how using this model can help simplify um, your code base um, for this type, of, this type of workflow. Did I see another hand in the back? Okay, really quick. Okay, so here's the bit.ly to the repo where these examples um, currently reside, if you wanna pull it up. Um, to start with, I'll show you uh, the, Gmo the Gmail export uh, module. We'll show you uh, a module that pulls down your tweet history for yourself or some list of people. Basically just opens up the, and handles all the pagination and basically will walk back and get as many um, activities as Twitter is happy to give you using the, the tokens you supply. Okay. I think that guy is over here. Cool. So um, the Gmail export uh, just uses the Gmail provider. Um, basically all you need is a Gmail account. You supply your username and password. You can put it in a, uh, the config file. You can supply it via command line or you can put it in environment variables and type safe will resolve it. Um, basically just start it up and it'll spit out your entire Gmail history both sent and received to the command line as either um, like free text or you can have it you can use the activity serializer that we put in the project and it'll, they'll come out looking like activities like I'm the actor and I emailed this person who is the, the target or vice versa. This person emailed me, they are the actor and I'm the target. Um, so this is maybe uh, useful if you're interested in doing, the, doing mining um, or analysis over your email history that Google doesn't supply as an application. And that's one of the kind of the main themes of what a lot of the stuff can be used for is if the, as if there's an application that you use, they have data feeds, but their application doesn't meet your needs, you should, it, you should feel free and it should be easy for you to go make a copy of it in a database that you control so you can fill the gap in the application. Um, so this is the Twitter, um, Twitter history collector. Um, the, by default, it hooks up to Elasticsearch. Um, 
you have to provide your own OAuth uh, details and your own uh, user ID. Tell it what Elasticsearch cluster you want it to go to, what to name the index, and what type um, it should use. Um, there's some examples in here of how you could how you would set up a mapping um, for tweets and retweets and act, the activity representation of tweets. So you just go load those into your Elasticsearch cluster and start it up. Um, and doing that, what you can what you can come out with in a pretty quick amount of time is a um, you can use the Kibana tool that ships with Elasticsearch um, when you install the Marvel plugin to go do perform term facets in a graphical interface and see um, uh, geospatial aggregations and stuff like that. And so it's kind of cool. Um, you can do this on your own account or you can do this really on any account that's public. So if there's a set of people or if you want to like go look at what um, a particular poster on a, on a blog has been tweeting about, this is actually kind of a cool way to get a sense for someone's um, online presence really quickly. You can see who they are, interact with often, um, at what frequency they post, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, I'll just go ahead and open up the actual main class for this one. So you can see, um, having created the Elasticsearch um, persistence module and the Twitter provider module, Your code ends up looking, you know, re like really, really simple. So the class goes and grabs the Twitter and Elasticsearch uh, type safe configs, runs the detect configuration um, static method provided with those modules, and then says, I want a three step workflow. I want a provider that pulls in the, that pulls in all the tweets as strings. Then I want to run the type converter from strings to activities. Then I want to go write it based on whatever the Elasticsearch configuration is. Um, there's nothing special. If this said um, provider, it would still work. Or if this said processor and this said persist writer, it would still work. Yeah. Cool. And uh, these are um, multi-threading hints like you sometimes provide to Storm um, that says basically for, I only need one thread open to, to read in this stuff, but then when I actually go convert it, go ahead and create some extra threads because um, It'll, you'll, you can basically run through the stream faster that way. It'll look almost exactly the same. Yeah, so instead of creating a local stream builder, you'll create a storm stream builder. Um, and then from then, the configuration step is taken care of for you. And the, um, uh, the, Storm Stream Builder will do the job of creating the, the topology and launching it. Yep. And I think I have an example of what that looks like in one of the other examples, which I might get to in a, in a little bit. Um, so that's just a, that's kind of a synopsis of how you can use this to go collect historical data out of APIs in order to build a, a data store for analysis, yes. Sure, so if you'll remember the, the processor step, unlike storm filter right now is not kind of a native top level um, concept in streams, but the processor interface allows you to do that by simply getting in your datum, um, deciding whether you want to pass it through or not, and then either returning an empty list or returning a list with the same, uh, with the same datum in it. Yes. This is a kind of a per, per provider kind of question. Um, so there are some providers, like the Twitter Firehost, for example, there's no notion of filtering, whereas a data sift Twitter connection, there is. So what ends up being different then is how you configure that provider. It will look for different fields in the type safe config when it goes to initialize the stream. Um, and how, how, how common the configurations of individual providers are, I think is just a matter for um, comes down to the dedication of the community to keep them consistent. 
So like Twitter's consumer key and so on, that's a Twitter kind of unique characteristic. Um, moreover, you'll need, you need different criteria to establish your stream. Um, so kind of each of the providers can ask the user to supply whatever details that they want in order to get the connection that'll bring in uh, what, they, what they're looking for. Ah, oh, yes. Um, so, will the provider interface or maybe the first list reader, right. if I'm correct, uh, will it allow for reading using filter? Right. So, currently, that is, again, that's left to the individual module. So, for example, the Elasticsearch module, which I'll show you in a little bit, it, its persist reader has, takes an index or like a list of types, a list of, um, a list of indexes, and then that is what it draws out from. Um, not yet exposed in the configuration, but down under the covers in some of the code we built, you can also say I want only items that have this field, or I only want items that are missing this field. So um, the way you take the persist reader from you know, everything in the database down tactically to just the set you're looking for, that's kind of a per database specific um, property. Um, but the, all the hooks are there to allow you to do that and to expose it via configuration in whatever way you know, makes sense for that specific persistence. Okay, so the next uh, example I'm gonna pull up is, um, so Twitter user streaming. So as, whereas this is kind of a one-time pull, um, User streaming is a, you open up a socket and you continue to pull data for however long the, the stream is open. Yeah, so this one uses, this one's built to use the local runtime. Um, you have to supply, there's a, you can supply follow, a follow array, you can supply track. It's basically passing through all the, the major features of the Twitter API um, without actually requiring you to connect to it with REST or to use the Hosebird client or to, to handle any of that. It's all handled for you. Um, yep, so if I uh, jump back into the code, it's gonna look pretty much exactly like what we looked at before, only instead of calling read current, we're calling start stream on the provider. And that provider will basically create a thread that uses the Hosebird client to connect up to Twitter and then begins passing events as they flow through into queues for processing um, downstream. So um, a, a good way you might use this is if you're, if you're like me, then the way you use Twitter is kind of every now and then you go log in and they show you the last 500 things that happened. So I actually use this to go constantly pull from my feed and put it in my own Elasticsearch database so that my experience with Twitter can be everything that came from everyone that I follow, right, all the time, not just the sample of what I happen to get at the moment that I happen to become interested in going to, to look. So then from there you can use Lucene in your Elasticsearch filter criteria to say, show me the things that were retweeted greater than X times, the things that were favorited greater number than X times. Um, basically take, giving all the power of what's in that data set to you um, rather than constraining you to whatever one simple application uh, might be. Um, so this is a going forward type of stream. There's no API that supplies this kind of on a Retro, retroactive basis, um, um, but that's okay. Um, so another example is similar to polling for everyone that I follow through the user stream, and that's the garden hose. So another uh, thing that we'll see here is that you can basically take your stream and write it out to two databases concurrently, and those two persisters will each take care of writing that each of those items out to wherever they're configured to write to. Um, so for example, out of the box, you could take this and you can put it in and it'll go and query the Twitter garden hose for all of these terms and then anything that's matching that you'll, you'll get. You can put hashtags in here as well. Um, and then here is my Elasticsearch cluster details. Here is my HDFS cluster details. Um, and so here you can see each, each persister kind of asks for whatever properties it needs in order to, to do its job. So the reason we do this is that we can, we can write it to Elasticsearch and update our, our analytics as the data comes in. Yet, if we wanna go in and add a new feature or add a new object by, or add a processor to the stream, um, 
all the data is stored in HDFS so that we can go use the, the pig runtime to go run through those steps and then write them out to Elasticsearch um, so that we get a new index with a new up-to-date greatest, latest and greatest picture of the entire history of the, of the data pool. Okay, so I'll show you an example of how we do batch processing. So the simplest possible um, kind of batch process is simply converting from the native object to the, to the activity object. And this is something that we you know, kind of tune on an ongoing basis. So essentially, this is what the pig script looks like in order to run the serializer on, a, on whatever path uh, contains all of the tweets that you, that you want to pull in. Um, so we're just saying define, like this is the class, the serializer class that we want to use. Stream serializer exec is a, you know, is a pig UDF wrapper around the actual um, thing that we want to run. Um, we load these up and then we run the, the serializer on the object. We filter by, make sure that there actually is an activity that came out, and then this gives us back a HDFS path that contains the exact, all the content from the source path, but with the activity serialization applied. Um, any questions about how this works? We have not written yet uh, anything that's native to Hadoop. Um, it seems like a lot of this, the, the stuff that we're doing right now, um, a simple pig UDF wrapper um, takes care of it um, quite well. And um, by picking which fields we define as static in the processors themselves, um, it's pretty efficient about object creation and um, inside of each of the map slots that are running the, the job. Um, so for an example of enrichment, this is the, uh, Basically, it looks almost the same, only we're calling a different processor, the link unwinder processor. So this will take um, in the links field of the activity, and it'll basically run a recursive um, HTTP get um, and you know follow the 300s in a certain way, follow the 400s, treat the 500s in a certain way, to bring back a URL that's a unique, um, distinctive fingerprint of that web page as opposed to just a shortened URL. Um, so whereas Twitter actually tries to do this and they give you an expanded URL, but they don't follow it recursively. So you end up like they have, a, they, your, the link is Tico and then the unwound link is Bitly, which is not super useful. So we put this inside of all of our um, data capture. And then if we came up with a better version of this again, like we just need to go back and, and rerun all of these processing steps using pig on the, on the full corpus. Um, and then there's also some Examples in here of how to do, um, so like deduplication, um, that kind of stuff. Pig makes it really easy to do that. And there's any number of pig articles or um, how to's uh, that you can use to handle steps like deduplication. Um, in case you've pulled the same thing twice from two different places, you can dedupe it using the, the unique ID early in the stream to make sure that you don't you know, do a bunch of processing on something you're just gonna throw away later. So yeah, let me see. I've got a, I think a couple more things on here. So yeah, so this is really built and oriented around being a real-time processing framework that also supports batch. Um, but it turns out it's also pretty good at doing um, ETL for no SQL. So, uh, one common um, thing that we, that we use this for is to take our Elasticsearch indexes and then re-index them into a new index that has a different mapping, um, making sure that the strings or date times or, or fields that we might want to tweak the mapping on in order to impact the way the aggregations work um, have changed. In Elasticsearch, you can't change that on a current index. You have to make a new one and restore it. So. Streams makes this really easy to do. Essentially, all we do is um, import the persist Elasticsearch, import runtime local, um, import logging, and then the, the Java class is basically an Elasticsearch reader and an Elasticsearch writer, and it just 
passes it right through. And if you wanted to put um, you know, processing steps in the middle, you certainly could by just adding, more pro adding processing steps. Um, you could also use it to go like, you could take your Elasticsearch documents and move them into Mongo, into Cassandra. Um, um, it's all just kind of objects and it's just a matter of, you can basically get, go from one place to the next with a JSON or an XML or, uh, or a Java object in the middle. Um, and it's just which readers and writers you put at the front and at the end of your stream. Okay, so that's all the examples that I had. Um, I kind of, I have some other slides that are kind of some things that we can talk about if you guys want to, or we can just take additional questions. So these are some of the items that are still kind of nascent in the framework, but, um, but are gonna get there. So handling logging for you, the logging libraries that you actually want in your jar file is based on the runtime you pull in. Um, so if you run in local mode, you, get, you can get log back. If you run in Hadoop, you can get um, SLF for J uh, to, to, log, um, to log for J. If you run in Storm, you can get you know, whatever, whatever's appropriate to make sure your log messages go where you want in Storm. Um, we wanna put some you know, additional measurement in there. Uh, part of the hardest part of handling these, like, these big data flows is just really knowing exactly what's happening at each step. Um, on a specific version of code, on a specific slice of data. Um, so uh, using, using logging, you can write this stuff out to, um, to, a, to a framework like, um, what's it called? So you can basically pipe your, your log back into, into Elasticsearch and then go use Kibana to, to look at, the, at how many activities happened at each time that met certain criteria like error warning and so on. Um, and then I think there'll be more, uh, more, for, more things in here about actually how to schedule jobs and terminate jobs and see which jobs are running um, at any moment in time and check the status from a web console. There's a web console in here, but uh, we need to do some more work at integrating it into the, uh, the local runtime and the, um, the pig and storm runtimes. And then there's quite a few interesting you know, things on the roadmap. Um, so there's, <clears throat> there's OSGI and Spring uh, and Camel in the project, although not fully hooked up to all of the providers and persisters. So that's one of the things we'll be looking at to get to our first release. Um, we wanna be able to do kind of ad hoc subscriptions. So given that there is a stream going to let you kind of tap into it from the web console or from an external um, node that's kind of outside of this specific deployed stream, um, provided you have credentials, you should be able to authorize against the stream and then tap into it and, and pull, it, uh, pull it down into your environment. We think this is a really important thing to facilitate data sharing in the enterprise. Um, better run console, um, additional run times. So I, I know there's a lot of people who use NSQ that we could definitely use NSQ to run, to run streams. Um, Amazon Kinesis is interesting. Uh, simply just having the right bindings in there so that you could deploy your stream to Kinesis. Um, additional databases, of course, like I was saying, the ability to send messages across the deployment of streams. Right now, it's kind of, you create your stream and it, it communicates, but there's not a lot of hooks into uh, streams that are outside. Um, so that's where the kind of the, the web app deployment that gets a static IP address, I think will be, will be really important um, so that parts of your stream can be in kind of transient or non, um, non-static IP type of architecture, but a couple of the points at the beginning in case you wanted to get a webhook stream in, or at the end in case you wanted to publish out a webhook stream or an RSS feed, you could run, you could basically say I want my, my storm topology to do most of the work, however I want these specific persistence or provider steps to run on inside of this instance of Tomcat sitting on the static IP address. Okay, that's all I've got. Any questions? Mm -hmm. 
you know, as well, we hope that the, the mailing list, right, can also become kind of a forum for discussion around how can we use activity streams to its fullest potential to actually do um, cross compatibility of data from different sources. Um, so, you know, the, the guys at, at one social company or social network may feel differently about that than the others. Um, they can both have an implementation out there um, that puts it into the format their way. And then the community can, you know, or debate the merits of one you know, model versus the other. And anyone's always free to go put in a, a converter that gets it into the, the format that they really need for what they're trying to do. So are there anything you guys have, you know, thoughts that have been triggered from this talk? Uh, or maybe any features or um, specific databases or data sources that, you know, if it was present? Would be you think would be really good. I don't think it's a replacement at all, right? I think it's a it's a way to simplify development for a for a architecture like that, while also maintaining flexibility to go run that business logic in an alternative runtime or using alternative data stores. So that's actually how we do it. We we have stores in the project that we use for property that we use for the And as well, if, if, if Kafka isn't right for you for whatever reason, you prefer to use NSQ or ActiveMQ or ZeroMQ, then it's just a matter of having that module available that treats that queuing system the same way that the Kafka wrapper treats the Kafka system and then swapping that out. Yes. Right, this is, it's, not an, it's not an ESB. There's no persistent thing that has to be on and running and properly configured with database administrators and everything else. You can write a stream that's literally just one JVM running 10 threads and get started that way, but then have the assurance that when you're ready to go run that at large scale at, on millions of items per minute, that you can, you'll be able to do that by switching to a different runtime at that point. 